Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the new ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standards for Digital Geospatial Data, Geobyte, that's being presented by Dr. Kazem Abdullah and Dr. Dave Monet. I would like to remind everybody that questions will be answered at the very end of the Geobyte and that we will be recording this. The recording will be available within a couple of days on the ASPRS website. Thank you. Dave, Kazem, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Ready. Okay. Going to start. Okay. I will start. Thank you, Ray. Hello, everybody. As uh, thank you, Ray, for the introduction. I'm Kasim Abdullah, I'm a geospatial senior geospatial scientist with Wuppert, and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll introduce the new standard we adopted here in the United States since the end of uh, 2014. Uh, uh, Dr. Dave Mowney is going to be a presenter, co-presenter with me here. And what you see here, the drafting committee, that's where really the whole thing is put together. It took us about three years, almost three years, to between Doug Smith and Dr. Mowney and Carl Heidman uh, as a long, dedicated effort to, to replace the old standard here. The new ASPRS uh, standard replaces ASPRS accuracy standard for large map, scale map, the 1990 standard. And it also replaces the ASPRS guideline for vertical accuracy reporting for LIDAR data was uh, implemented at the time. As developed by uh, ASPRS accuracy standard working group and uh, uh, working with PAD, the primary acquisition, data acquisition, and PAD, uh, and LIDAR Joint Committee for Map Accuracy and uh, the, As I mentioned earlier, the final version was approved during the board meeting on November 17, 2014, in Denver during the 2014 PECORA, the fall conference. The, I would like to just introduce the statement of the problem and motivation behind the development of the and adoption of the of the new standard. The geospatial community definitely witnessing a new era of collaboration in understanding, managing, and evaluating the quality of geospatial data, whether derived from orthology or light. So the ASPRS spearheaded the effort to introduce a new accuracy standards that are more suitable for today's geospatial data kind derived from digital sensor and more modern processes. During their development, ASPR coordinated efforts with the, uh, the U.S. Geological Services and the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to ensure consistency and harmony among each organization respective standard guideline and manual. And it helps here like Dr. Dave Mowney was uh, heading the development of the new manual for photogrammetry and LIDAR and that make it easier to coordinate between that standard, that manual and the new standard. And the same thing, the same thing Carl H Heidman represented the UGS on the on the lidar specs, 1.2 and 1.3. So we 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 were a really good group, inclusive of all these authorities, to make sure all these standards are coordinated together, or the or the manual and the standard. And again, thanks to the agreement among G agency, which I just said on the main accuracy measure, it is easier for users to understand and compare product specifications that use ASPRS, UAGS, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers methodology. So we, we adopted the slogan of new standard for a new era. And the, the legacy mapping accuracy standards such as the ASPRS 1990 and the National Map Accuracy Standard of 1947 definitely are outdated. They are over 30 years since ASPRS 1990 was written. 
many of the data acquisition and mapping technology that the center were based on are no longer used. I mean, paper maps and, and analog plotters and, and films camera, for example, especially here in North America and United States. More recent advances in mapping technology can now produce better quality and higher accuracy geospatial products and map. And of course, the old standard, like I said, has been based on the capability of the technology at the time, analog, plotters, film. Uh, with, the, with the introducing the new technology and the processes and the computer process to uh, processing capability, we definitely are able to get more accurate products with the, nowadays. The legacy map accuracy standard were designed to deal with the plotted or drawn maps as the only medium to represent geospatial data. And this is a very important aspect because at that time, all we talking about accuracy on a paper and viewing on papers and plotting on papers, and we don't really deal with it, which, which means map scale. I mean, we moved away from that for a while. Within the past two decades, during the transition period between the hard copy and soft copy mapping environment, most standard measures for relating GSD and map scale to final mapping accuracy were inherited from photogrammetric practices using a scanned film. And here I just want to show the, the table where when we moved from hard copy to soft copy photogrammetry, when we start to scanning film and then move to the digital camera, we didn't really have measures to state the accuracy or represent the accuracy of the product. So what we did, we really relied on what we extracted from the film photography. And we said, for example, if I say, one inch to 7200 photo scale, we saying like using the 6x, 6x enlargement ratio, we are saying in the digital world when we move to scanning and digital camera, we say that scale support ortho production uh, with a GSD of 15 centimeters, 6 inch and contour interval of 60 centimeter or two foot. And, and the production of a map scale, planimetric map scale of a 12, 1 to 1200 or 1 inch equal 100 foot. And that's what we use for the last 15 to 20 years since we moved to soft copy and digital camera. But that's, that's not a good way to relate it because like we said, the new technology, new digital camera, give us a better accuracy than what, what we derive, what you see here from the film. Uh, bullet two is a new map. The new mapping process and methodology have become much more sophisticated with advances in technology and advances in our knowledge of mapping processes and mathematical models. Uh, again, I mean, everybody witnessing uh, very sophisticated cameras, very sophisticated software, or measurement all in soft copy environment, and so on. Map accuracy can no longer be associated with the camera geometry and flying altitude alone. Focal length, the principal point x, p, y, p, p over h ratio, and so on. If you're familiar with it, most of our flight design, flight plan design, all we use focal plan, uh, focal length, and and you know, uh, and the quality and determination of the principal point and p over h ratio. But that's that's uh, sorry, that's not a true. Mapping process doesn't involve only camera anymore. Before it just the camera, and that's the camera focal length and principal point and so on. The map accuracy is influenced by many factors in addition to the camera, such as the, uh, the quality of the camera calibration parameter, for example, quality and size of the CCD, uh, with the 
chargeable device of a new digital camera, amount of imagery overlap, quality of parallax determination or photo measurement, quality of GPS signal, quality and density of ground control, quality of aerial triangulation solution and software and modeling you are using, such as GPS drift and shift, camera self-calibration, and the digital terrain modeling used for orthorective applications. All these really play into a new system now of mapping. It's not just camera. So they all have their own accuracy and limitations, for example. These factors can vary widely from project to project, depending on sensor use and specific methodology. For this reason, existing accuracy measure based on map scale film scale, GSD, C factor, and static resolution no longer apply to current geospatial mapping practices. Elevation project, for example, from a new technology such as LIDAR and IPSAR, wasn't represented, are not considered by the legacy mapping standards. So we need a new accurate standard that can accommodate these technologies. So the new ASBR is Positional Accuracy Standard for Geospatial Data Applicability defines specific accuracy classes and associated, associated root mean square error threshold for digital ortho, digital planimetric map, line map, and digital elevation data. Intended, intended to be technology independent, and you will discuss it later, limited to accuracy threshold and testing methodology for any mapication and to meet immediate shortcoming in the outdated 1990 and 2004 standard. It's not intended to cover a classification accuracy of thematic maps, does not specify the best practice or methodology needed to meet the accuracy threshold, uh, because that's a totally different topics here. And the new standard, we included glossary, symbols, example, and conversion to and from the legacy standards, for example. So structure and format, the standard structure as follows. The primary term and definition reference and requirement are stated within the main body of the standard according to ISBR standard template and without extensive explanation or justification. Detailed supporting guideline and background information are attached as annexes A to through D. Annex A provide background summary of other standards, specification, and or guideline relevant to ASPRs, but which do not satisfy current requirement for digital geospatial data. And XP provide accuracy quality example and overall guideline for implementing the standard. And XC provide guideline for accuracy testing and reporting. And NXD provide guideline for statistical assessment and examples for computing for vertical accuracy and vegetated and non-vegetated terrain. The highlight of the new standard. Position accuracy threshold, which are independent of public GSD map scale or contour interval for digital ortho imagery and digital elevation data. Additional accuracy measure we added, aerial triangulation accuracy, never been addressed before. We added it to the standard. Ground control accuracy, we added to the standard. Ortho imagery seam line accuracy is added to the standard. LIDAR relative SWAT to SWAT accuracy is added. Recommended minimum nominal pulse density MPD uh, is dealt with in the standard. Horizontal accuracy of elevation A data is adopted in the standard. Delineation of low confidence area for vertical data also added. Required number and spatial distribution of QAQC checkpoints based on a project area are also uh, adopted and explained here. So one important aspect of the new standard, it is all metrics. As you know, in the United States, we use the inch and foot uh, throughout the standard. We move to all metric now as unlimited 
horizontal accuracy classes. And that's what we mean technology independent because we we figure out if we're going to give certain classes like the old one did the class one, class two, class three, we limit ourselves in the, in the first development of the technology if we get more accurate system can produce more accurate product and math. So uh, we did it very open. The horizontal accuracy class, it is defined by the by the root mean square error of the product. So if, if the product accurate to 10 centimeters, you need it to be accurate to 10 centimeters. We call it 10 centimeter dash centimeter. That's the class name. So it is open. If tomorrow you, you fly something or you use technology, it gives one centimeter accuracy. You can you can you have room in this standard to say I need one centimeter a class a product for example. And here what you see the rest of the column, the the radial RMSE horizontal accuracy at 95, and also imagery mosaic seam line which is equal or smaller than two times x, which is the root mean square error of the x and y. And here just shows you, just we give example for the common horizontal accuracy classes. We took it from 0.63 centimeter, for example, to to a thousand centimeter. But you can you can plug in any number you have uh, or you dealing with. So if if my horizontal accuracy class root mean square error x and y 15 centimeter, for example. I mean uh, the here or the the RMSE R will be in this case 21. The ortho mosaic seam line maximum mismatch will be 2 x to the 15 will be 30, and horizontal accuracy at 95 will be 36 centimeter and so on. Example on horizontal accuracy for digital ortho. Uh, Again, we did not adopt a class one, a class two, a class three, but here we just just give an example of that system, so people will be aware of it. So if in the old center, again, if my accuracy 15 centimeters common ortho pixel size, the we associate like I mentioned earlier from that table at the beginning I showed that 15 centimeter it will produce a map or support the production of a map of 1 to 1200. And it will have three accuracy classes. Class 1, the RMSC will be 30 centimeter, which is 2 pixel. Class 2 will be 4 pixel, 6 centimeter. And a class 3 will be 6 pixel, 90 centimeter. With the Digital ortho accuracy example for the current large and medium format metric camera. Here's like now with the with the current technology, the large format camera, whether ADS or DMC or UltraCam. If I have 15 centimeter ortho pixel, for example, or GSD, we we. We recommend, that's not required in the new standard, but we recommend it can meet accuracy of, could be 15 centimeter, up to 15 centimeter, which is one pixel in the old terms of the old standard. And that's for the highest accuracy required, and that's required definitely more stringent workflow, more ground control, because in the old standard, the best accuracy we can meet two pixel. Now we are saying probably you can meet one pixel, or if you want it equivalent to the old standard, standard GIS work, two pixel, or larger than three pixel for visualization and less accurate work. And horizontal accuracy quality example for high accuracy digital planimetric data here example. We just given 
the new standard comp how it compared to the to the 1990 standard on national map accuracy. Again, if I take the 15 centimeter, the horizontal accuracy at 95 will be 36. Approximate GSD for source imagery will be from 7.5 centimeter to 15 centimeter because it depends, like we I show earlier, whether one pixel or two pixel accuracy. And that will be equivalent to the old center standard with map accuracy of 1 to 600 or uh, class 2 or 1 to 300 for example or uh, to map a scale with 1 to 380 according to the national map accuracy standard. Then just to take uh, the user back and forth if they have uh, existing data how they related to, to a new mapping uh, collect, for example. Uh, okay. Dave, I think you, your turn now. You can move on here. Yes, I'm Dave Mowney from Dewberry, and I'll be talking about the uh, elevation data, vertical accuracy classes. Similar to the horizontal, we have generic classes where you can specify any vertical accuracy class you want based on the uh, vertical RMSC in, in open, non-vegetated terrain. So think of X as a generic value that you could choose anything you want in specifying a standard. So that is based on the RMSEZ in non-vegetated terrain and, and we uh, have a term with non-vegetated terrain in which we have vegetated vertical accuracy and non-vegetated vertical accuracy. You see NVA and VBA there. So NVA is at the 95% confidence level based on RMSE times 1.96 and the vegetated vertical accuracy is three times the class uh, as shown there whatever your X class is that's chosen. We have relative relative accuracy criteria here within swath that's the hard surface repeatability for imagine a hard uh, flat surface how repeatable is it? We have a specification there of 0 0.6 times X. We have swath to swath uh, relative accuracy in non-vegetated terrain and there we have a root mean square difference value at 0 0.8 times the value of X and we have swath to swath in non-vegetated terrain what the maximum difference is is 1.6 times uh, times X and, and sometimes you may have uh, we call them DZ orthos where we subtract one from another set and see how large the differences are and you can see uh, what your maximum differences are there. Next slide please. Now this takes that generic formula and applies it to a number of standard vertical accuracy classes from one centimeter up to 333 and we actually went on but we didn't make this slide show everything as it expands out to uh, many meters in size. Uh, so. This applies the same formulas from the prior slide into a number of discrete vertical accuracy classes shown in the left column. So this is just filling out a table using the criteria from the prior slide. Next slide, Cousin. Okay, now this compares the new standard with some of the legacy standards. For example, if you look at the 10 centimeter vertical class, which is rather common, it has an RMSEZ of 10 centimeters. That would compare with the equivalent class one of 30 centimeters per the ASPRS 1990 standards. The same 1990 standards allowed you to have class one, class two, or class three. So that would be like a 15 centimeter class two is the same as a 30 centimeter class one. That may be confusing to some people, but that's what was written into the old ASPR standards from 1990. And then going back to the National Map Accuracy Standards of 1947, that, uh, that would be the equivalent to a contour interval of 32.9 centimeters. And you can look at the other examples there. Okay, now here, there are some examples of, uh, examples of vertical accuracy and recommended LIDAR point density uh, for elevation data. The vertical accuracy classes there are on the left. 
The RMSC non-vegetated is shown there. The non-vegetated vertical accuracy to 95% confidence level is in the third column. And then it has a recommended minimum nominal point density, points per square meter, and recommended maximum nominal point spacing. And we have some footnotes that explain these terms. Now what's highlighted there with the red box is what is the standard QL2 LIDAR required for the new 3D elevation program. So that is the new national standard, the QL2 LIDAR data. It has two points per square meter, which has a nominal pulse spacing of 0 0.707 meters in order to get you two points per square meter density, and it has an RMSE of 10 centimeters. So that's, that's the new standard. So if anybody says they need LIDAR, if we can, if we can encourage them to use the, this national standard for the three depth program, I think it will be to everybody's benefit. So that's why I wanted to uh, highlight for this particular box. Next slide, please. Okay, now we have some horizontal accuracy requirements for elevation data. Sometimes we only tend to think of testing the vertical accuracy of, of elevation data, but we also can check the horizontal accuracy. For photogrammetric elevation data, the horizontal accuracy equates to the horizontal accuracy class that would apply to planimetric data or digital orthoimagery produced from that same source imagery using the same uh, triangulation INS solution that we have shown you or are going to show you below. LIDAR elevation data, we recommend using this formula here, but that comes with some caveats in the uh, uh, in the ASPRS standards that explains a little bit about how these numbers were derived. But it's a function of how accurate your GPS or your GNS, GNSS positioning is and how accurate your uh, IMU is. And some IMUs are more accurate than others. Next slide, please. Now these are some expected horizontal accuracy root mean square error radial or LIDAR data in terms of, of typical flying altitudes here. We have altitudes of 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 meters. The uh, expected positional RMSE are flown at a such and such an altitude and what the positional RMSE uh, R would be in centimeters. Uh, uh, at, I, I have two different, two different sets of columns here where the altitudes actually vary all the way up to 5,000 meters here. Okay, next slide, please. Now, relative accuracy of elevation data, we have include two aspects for data quality, within swath accuracy and swath to swath accuracy. Think of within swath accuracy as how smooth or repeatable is a surface. It verifies the internal stability of the instrument or the repeatability of the system when detecting flat, hard surfaces. The swath to swath accuracy is associated with LIDAR swaths or, or IFSAR uh, swaths, and it's a measure of the quality of the system calibration and bore sighting in the airport and GNSS trajectories. Next slide, please. We also specify low confidence areas. For decades, we used to specify low confidence for photogram photogrammetric contours when the photogrammetrist could not see the ground in stereo, normally in forested areas where the trees were in the way and you could not put that floating, floating dot on the ground. And we were supposed to do contouring using dashed contours. Well, the equivalent of that today with digital elevation data is low confidence areas in which we designate polygons in which we feel that we have lower than the confidence that would be expected for the accuracy class that has been specified. And here we have a recommended minimum nominal point density or maximum nominal pulse spacing. We have recommended low confidence area criteria for minimum nominal ground point density and maximum nominal ground point spacing. In, in terms of points per square meter and meters. We have criteria for the search radius and cell size for computing the nominal ground point density. And we have low confidence polygon minimum areas in acres and uh, square meters for the various vertical accuracy classes. 
when you read the ASPRF uh, standards, there's there's additional sections that go into details that explain these various parameters on how we go about defining uh, low confidence area polygons. Next slide, please. Okay, we also have accuracy requirements for aerial triangulation and in-space sensor orientation of digital imagery. And when it comes to uh, aerial triangulation designed for digital planimetric data for ortho, ortho imagery or digital planimetric maps only, then the RMSC X and Y uh, horizontally are uh, one half the RMSC of the map. But when it comes to vertical, the Z value is less important when you're basically producing planimetric maps or ortho imagery. So there's not a one half in front of the RMSC Ys, Y uh, for the uh, or RMSC R for the uh, ortho imagery. But when it comes to accuracy of aerial triangulation designed for elevation data, then we again have the RMSE X, RMSE Y from the aerial triangulation, or the RMSE Z from aerial triangulation is one half the RMSE X, RMSE Y, RMSE Z. Next slide, please. Okay, requirements for ground control and aerial triangulation. We have accuracy for ground control designed for planimetric data, again, orthos and digital planimetric map production only. RMSC X and RMSC Y is one-fourth the RMSC X and Y, but the RMSC Z is one-half. Again, it's the same logic. We don't have to have the Z as accurate when you're producing uh, orthos and planimetric maps. But in that bottom, bottom bullet, the accuracy of ground controls designed for elevation data here the RMSE X, Y, and Z are all one-fourth the RMSE X, Y, and Z of the map or the DEM being produced. Again, more details are explained in the actual standards. Next slide, please. Okay, we have some examples of aerial triangulation and ground control accuracy here. We selected a uh, sample product with an RMSE X and Y of 50 centimeters. Using the criteria in the prior slides, the AP accuracy in RMSE X would be a half, 25 centimeters, but the RMSE in Z equals the same, 50 centimeters. Ground control accuracy has tighter numbers, one half the values in the two prior columns, 12 and a half centimeters, and 25 centimeters. Now, uh, aerial triangulation and ground control accuracy, ortho imagery and planimetric data, and elevation data. Now, the, uh, for the same parameters, you will see that the RMSE Z value has jumped down to 25 centimeters, where in the top row it was at 50 centimeters. And the same thing for the ground control accuracy, the RMSE Z is now 12 and a half centimeters, where in the row above it was 25 centimeters. All that is based on the fact that you need higher accuracy in Z when you are producing an elevation product than what you need when you are producing a planimetric product or an orthophoto. Next slide, please. Now we have different ways of reporting horizontal accuracy and vertical accuracy. In this slide, we're looking at the horizontal. And we, we thought it was advisable to report what was required and what was actually tested. And so in this first sentence it said the data set was tested to meet ASPRS positional accuracy standards for digital geospatial data for a specified RMSE X and Y. What was it that the client asked for here? It was tested to meet that, but it was actually the actual positional accuracy was found to be hopefully an RMSE X and Y smaller numbers than what was asked for. That would show that you exceeded what the client asked for. And then when you know what the RMSE X and the RMSE Y are, you can compute the RMSE and multiply that by the multiplier to come up with the uh, accuracy plus or minus so many centimeters at the 95% confidence level. Now if the data was not tested and it was just produced to meet a certain standard, 
Then we report pretty much as we have done in the past. This data set was produced to meet ASPRS positional accuracy standards for GGR geospatial data at a certain standard, which equates to what that multiplier would have it to come out to be at the 95% confidence level. So the first one is when it was tested, and the second one was when it was not tested, but it was produced to meet that. And that's rather consistent with what the old the National Standard for Spatial Data Accuracy had two different requirements for testing and then uh, just produced to or compiled to meet is what NSSDA call it. Now on the vertical it's very similar. When it was tested, this data was tested to meet ASPRS positional accuracy standards for digital geospatial data for, let's use that 10 centimeter example, if it were quality level 2, that first blank box would have said it was tested to meet this 10 centimeter RMSEZ, but the actual NBA accuracy was found to be RMSEZ of, say, 7 centimeters or some number hopefully lower than 10, which equates to another number at the 95% confidence level, and that is what your RMSEZ multiplied by 1.96 would turn out to be at the 90 95% compass level. And then the actual vegetative vertical accuracy was found to be, uh, that is the number at the 95th percentile. I don't know if I pointed out earlier that the, the uh, non-vegetative vertical accuracy uses the RMSE times 1.96, but the vegetative vertical accuracy uses the 95th percentile that is very, the very same thing we did with the old ASPRS uh, guidelines for vertical accuracy reporting. The reason we do that in vegetative terrain is because we cannot statistically demonstrate that errors in vegetation follow a normal air distribution. We find that there are outliers, and I'm going to show you an example of those outliers here in a minute. So in vegetative terrain, the RMSE process will greatly skew and over, overstate the size of the air. Uh, would you go back to the prior slide, please? Yeah. Uh, and, and similarly, with the data was produced to meet the ES. So if there was no testing, you say what it was, was produced to meet, uh, both the uh, NDA and the VBA. NDA at the 95% confidence level based on RMSE, and VBA at the 95% all. OK, next slide, please. Okay, and here we have a recommended number of checkpoints based on area. We worked from uh, lower than 500 square kilometers up to 2,500 square kilometers, and we specify the number of checkpoints uh, used for uh, horizontal accuracy testing of ortho photos and, and planometrics. And then on the right three columns, we have vertical and horizontal accuracy testing of elevation data sets, and we have an increasing number there for the test points in, in non-vegetated and in vegetated terrain and the total number in the right column there. Now, a lot of people will wonder, well, what happens if the data that I am collecting is an area larger than 2,500 square kilometers? And we, do, we want everybody to know that you don't just double this if you have an area of 5,000 square kilometers. Do not double these numbers because that will be overkill and you will be paying too much for the number of checkpoints. Once you've reached these 100 checkpoints, you have reached a statistically significant enough number of checkpoints where we need fewer checkpoints, if any, in larger categories. I'm going to read you uh, two uh, statements from the ASPRS standards. It says, for horizontal accuracy testing of areas greater than 2,500 square kilometers, client should determine the number of additional horizontal checkpoints, if any, based on criteria such as resolution of the imagery and extent of urbanization. You may not need any more checkpoints in a 5,000 uh, square kilometer area. It depends on a number of factors there but we think you will have a st statistically significant number of checkpoints with the uh, six, 60 points there that are in that uh, column for the horizontal accuracy testing. 
The ASPR standard also says that for vertical accuracy testing of areas greater than 2,500 square kilometers, add five additional vertical checkpoints for each 500 square kilometer area. Each additional set of five vertical checkpoints for the 500 square kilometer area would include three checkpoints for the MBA and two for the VBA. The recommended number and distribution of NBA and VBA checkpoints may vary depending on the importance of different land cover categories and client requirements. So this is new, but a lot of people have contacted me and said they kind of like what we've done here. And so I, I think we're off to a good start with this change. Next slide, please. OK, now there are things we did not address with these new standards. We did not address methodologies for the accuracy assessment of linear features. Take the accuracy assessment of a brake line, for example. A brake line is a linear feature that may have uh, and maybe may meander in unusual directions. It's very hard to to test the vertical accuracy of that. Though different people are proposing ideas on how we might do that. We did not do that in this standard. We relied on, on, on point features rather than linear features. So we were able to test point features, clearly defined point features when it comes to horizontal data. But the points do not have to be clearly defined and often are not clearly defined when it comes to uh, 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 elevation data. Now, I would say that, Kassam, uh, would you go back to the prior slide? Uh, we, on the vertical data here, when we say the number of 3D checkpoints in NBA and, and in VBA, we actually have some guidelines that we would like some of those checkpoints, if possible, on LiDAR data to be on features that can be seen in LiDAR intensity images or something like that. Uh, so as the end of a paint stripe. If you are able to survey some of those points in the non-vegetated area, we have we have a, a few words of text in the actual standard that recommends a percentage of those be on features that can be clearly defined on LiDAR intensity images so that we have some way of assessing the horizontal accuracy of, of LiDAR data as well. OK, back to the next slide, please. OK, uh, the, the second bullet there, we did not address rigorous total propagated uncertainty modeling, uh, as opposed to or in addition to ground truthing against independent data sources. A number of people are working on that. Uh, I know Chris Parrish is working on that. I don't know if Chris is on the line today, but there are several people that are, are very interested in, in assessing total propagated uncertainty, where you take into account all the different factors that could impact the, uh, the accuracy or the inaccuracy of a product. Third bullet there says a robust statistics for data sets that, that do not meet the criteria for normally distributed data and therefore cannot be rigorously assessed using the statistical methods specified therein. We already mentioned that we uh, are using the 95th percentile in areas is where we find that uh, the errors do not follow a normal distribution, but there may be other cases as well where errors do not follow a normal distribution. Uh, the next bullet shows that for image quality factors such as edge definition and other characteristics, we did not have a way to assess the positional accuracy of, of those kind of things. And, and the, uh, the, the quality of edges is rather similar to the quality of linear features, and that is very difficult to do that. Uh, the next bullet, robust assessment of checkpoint distribution and density. We leave a lot of flexibility. We give some guidelines, and guidelines on how to do that. But in many cases, people need to determine what makes the most sense to them. Uh, is it important to test uh, elevation data in various vegetation categories, for example, or is the accuracy in vegetation not that important? FEMA has its requirements. The Corps of Engineers may have its requirements that vary, and different customers may have their varying requirements. So 
we did not want to strictly dictate that thou shalt do something precisely because we felt the people needed uh, some flexibility to apply common sense. We did not apply alternate methodologies to pin interpolation for vertical accuracy assessment. There are several methods for doing it, and uh, most people have their own preferred ways of, of, of how what pin interpolator they use because the checkpoint that is surveyed is never exactly on the coordinate of a uh, LIDAR point, but uh, it's usually somewhere within a pin triangle somewhere. And so we interpolate that pin to the coordinates of the checkpoint. That's what we currently do, and we have not provided alternative methodologies for that. So we're pretty much sticking with the status quo there. OK, now we have an example of user asked for ortho imagery with a ground sample distance of 10 centimeters. What specification he or she needs to ask for? According to the legacy standards of, of 1990, this most probably would be horizontal accuracy, RMSC, 20 centimeters would be two pixels, which would be the class one for a map scale of 1 to 800. According to the new standard, the RMSC would be 10 centimeters for the highest obtainable accuracy, and uh, RMSC of 20 centimeters for what would have traditionally been considered uh, ASPRS class 1. Practical specs RMSC is 15 centimeter, no scale to be assigned, so that you could have something between those two to extreme. So you actually have the flexibility to specify, or the user has the flexibility to specify uh, virtually any uh, horizontal accuracy class that, that the user wants. So it could be between what we call the highest accuracy and, and the, uh, the standard accuracy there. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to give you an example of an actual LiDAR data set that my company evaluated. It had uh, 100 QAQC checkpoints in five land cover categories. And, and I was telling you that LiDAR data does not necessarily follow a normal air distribution. Here you will see that 98 points approximated a normal air distribution, but there were two outliers. One outlier uh, in, in forested areas and another one in, uh, in weeds and crops. And I'm going to work through this actual example to show you how this will work. Next slide, please. Now this shows you the number of checkpoints. There's 20 in each of the five major land cover categories. It shows the minimum discrepancy for the 20 checkpoints in each of those categories and the maximum. And you'll see there an open train, for example, the minimum was 10 below zero, and the maximum was 8 centimeters above the, uh, the tested value. But when it comes down to weeds and crops, there is that outlier that was 49 centimeters in tall weeds and crops. And down in fully forested, you have an outlier that was 70 centimeters. I have found that this is rather typical when you get into vegetated terrain. The next column shows the mean errors, and then we have a skew and kurtosis. We have standard deviation, and we have the RMSE. And you will see that for the weeds and crops and for fully forested, the standard deviations and the RMSE jump way up. And so if you base your accuracy at the 95% confidence level, based on RMSE times 1.96, you will have one or two outliers tell you that your whole data set failed when really it is beyond the control of the LiDAR data provider in most cases to do something about that. If, you, if your last return shows you there uh, and you're in a forest somewhere, you may not be able to do anything about that. And so it is that phenomenon of LiDAR data in vegetation in which is the reason why we called for the 95th percentile rather than using RMSE or, or standard deviation. Next slide, please. Now, when, when we use the uh, RMSE times 1.96, you will see what the NSS SDA was there 
in open terrain, urban terrain, weeds and crop, brushlands, and fully forested. And there you'll see weeds and crops 25 centimeters and fully forested 33. Now if you use the, we previously had the National Digital Elevation Program had fundamental vertical accuracy, FVA, plus supplemental vertical accuracy and consolidated vertical accuracy. That was also in the prior ASPRS standards based on the 95th percentile. So if you look at that second column there, the 95th percentile has 15 centimeters for weeds and crops where the NSSDA method would have had 25 centimeters for weeds and crops. Also for the uh, fully forested, the 95th percentile has 21 centimeters, whereas the old RMSE method would have had 33 centimeters. That alone would have caused the data set to fail. Now with the new ASPRS standards, the last two uh, columns on the right, what we are doing is we are really merging the old fundamental vertical accuracy in open terrain and the supplemental vertical accuracy in urban terrain, both of them non-vegetated categories, into the new NVA non-vegetated vertical accuracy. And that is where the RMSE methodology still works. And so we would have 12 centimeters there instead of any of the criteria shown in the columns to the left. Similarly, for vegetated vertical accuracy, that is essentially a combination of weeds and crops, brushlands, forest, fully forested, or any other vegetated category you might think of. You might come up with mangrove swamps or cane fields or wheat fields or what have you. It could be almost anything. We are now calling, con consolidating all those into what we call vegetated vertical accuracy. And so this is showing how those three categories from the past, three supplemental vertical accuracy categories from the past are now our new vegetated vertical accuracy which comes in at 16.7 centimeters. We no longer advocate a consolidated vertical accuracy. Now at the same time, if any of you out there are data producers for FEMA, and if FEMA still wants vegetated vertical accuracy in weeds and crops and brushlands and fully, fully forested, I encourage you to do all of the above. It, it is just a, a very minor change into your accuracy spreadsheet to do it all different way. In fact, my company does it the old way and the new way so that we are readily able to show our clients what it is with the new standard compared to the old standard that some, some other client may still ask for. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here is our website and where you can download the final document. Uh, and uh, Kasim and I are now open for questions. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, first question, are the numbers of checkpoints evenly dispersed across the project site and not concentrated to one area? We all, This is Dave Mounty. I'll answer that question. We do not want quality control checkpoints concentrated in one area. Carl Heidemann shows a famous example where a data set was turned into USGS. Every one of the checkpoints was in one Walmart shopping uh, parking lot. It was a countywide data set and every checkpoint was consolidated in in one parking lot. That is exactly the wrong thing to do. We like them distributed around the area to be representative of different uh, land cover categories, that sort of thing. Now some people may some people may put in clusters of points. For example, if under the old FEMA guidelines, FEMA FEMA might ask for a checkpoint in open terrain, one in urban terrain, one in uh, uh, low weeds and crops, one in shrub, and one in fully forested. Some people put in clusters that they, they surveyed in a GPS central point from which they reached out radially and reached into the woods with a total station to get a fully forested checkpoint. They reached into an urban area 
to get a uh, some points on asphalt, and then they reached the different vegetation categories. And so they would have a cluster here, a cluster there, a cluster spread all over the place. But it's possible to use cluster points. But uh, it, when when those clusters contain uh, different land cover categories, but do not cluster points in the same land cover category. Does that answer the question, or are there still more on that? That's an important question. I think so that answers the question. Um, next question. Is there any mention about the LIDAR classification accuracies? I suspect that the, these outliers in the forest and weeds and crops are actually results of ground misclassification rather than the LIDAR sensor ability to penetrate the ground. It is possible that the uh, that the airs and vegetation area uh, may be totally beyond your control, or it may be uh, because of airs in the QAQC checkpoints. I have seen some scenarios in which we were able to determine, based on checkpoints elsewhere, that there seems to be an outlier that we suspected was an error in the survey checkpoint itself. My company often goes back and asks for the surveyor to re-verify that a point is uh, was surveyed correctly. And sometimes the surveyor admits a mistake, and uh, sometimes they don't. And that does create a problem, because we never want to have a data set fail because of an error made by the surveyor. One of the errors that I I personally get on my pedestal and tell this case wherever possible is a a case study in which my company Dewberry was hired by a county to determine why it was that two lidar data sets of the county produced by two different vendors and produced and and validated by two different QAQC firms. Both said the two data sets tested to have one foot contour accuracy or 10 centimeter RMSE. And yet when you laid the two LIDAR data sets side by side, there was a two foot wall between one LIDAR data set and the other one. And they said, how can that be if both of them are accurate to one foot contours that we have this wall between the two LIDAR data sets along the seam line? There is no wall in the county anything of that sort. In fact, the county was considered basically flat. Well, when we looked into it, we found that both the LIDAR firms and the QA firms had used the same control points as the base stations for GPS. And when you do that, any errors in your control point will cancel out, and your data set will look good. Now, one pair of firms used base stations, control points that were in the nation, National Spatial Reference System and had been recently uh, validated relative to core stations. The other one, both the LIDAR firm and the QAQC firm had used a local benchmark that was not in the National Spatial System. It had never been GPS survey relative to cores, and it was, in fact, in air by about two feet when surveyed relative to the cores. And so that was the underlying reason on why, even when a data set passes, it can be wrong, because both the LIDAR firm and the survey firm did the wrong thing by not using best professional practice to select their control monument in the first place. And so the errors can work both ways there. And, and all of us in this business need to be conscientious to select the best base stations for our control, to, to select realistic uh, checkpoints. For example, another point of, of our checkpoints is that vertical checkpoints should never be close to break lines where there is a change in slope. And uh, I use the example of the worst vertical checkpoint I can think of is on a bridge abutment. Because a vertical checkpoint on a bridge abutment, you are going to interpolate the 
the x and y coordinates of that checkpoint on both the left and right side of that bridge abutment. But where the LIDAR is on one side may be down at the water level and on the other side may be on the bridge deck. And when you interpolate between the water level and the bridge deck, it's probably going to be somewhere around halfway between the river and the top of the bridge and it will make your LIDAR data look inaccurate when it may be perfectly accurate. So that's an example of where the surveyors doing the surveys are supposed to stay back. We normally say at least five meters, and it could be more than that, from, uh, from break lines or where there's a distinct change in slope, and preferably on, on, on terrain that is not very steep, less than 10 degrees, and is relatively smooth and not uh, rapidly, rapidly undulating. David, can you read me the, the question again, if you don't mind? Um, is there any mention about the LIDAR classification accuracies? I suspect that the outliers in the forest and weeds and crops are actually results. I just want to add to it, just in case we're not addressing it uh, uh, by Dave. I think, no, we don't have any mention about the classification accuracy. I think, I think for user who are asking this, probably they need to refer to the UHGS specs. Because we're not saying if how many houses are classified as house or removed or, or remain in the, in the bare earth dam. We're not saying how many square acre, uh, kilometer or acre, for example, of vegetation left. We don't really address that. I mean, I, th I, that's, I think that's my understanding of the question. And you may be referring to the last classification where you have classes for uh, yeah. Yeah, the dirt. Yeah, I think, I think that's the question. But, but we don't really have any criteria if you find 10 buildings out of 100 buildings, for example. You know? So that's totally the... The ASVRS standard really didn't deal with it, and I think intentionally, but I think the UAGS has has a place for it, I think. like 2% or 1% or something like that, I remember. Any more questions, Dave? Yeah, next question. How should the checkpoints be distributed in a mountainous area? Oh boy. In a mountainous area? Okay, well, that is that is difficult because you try to get on terrain that is not very steep, and so it's best if you have and and away from edges, and so uh, you do not want to have a a, a checkpoint near near a cliff or anything like that, and uh, and you, you, we try to if if you're checking vertical accuracy, uh, we don't like horizontal errors to cause something to to appear to have a, uh, a vertical error caused by the horizontal. So that's the reason why uh, we don't like steep slopes. And so if there is some, uh, if there's some parts of the mountain that are relatively flat, we we like your checkpoints out there and, and away from edges. Yeah, I, I agree with Dave. I think avoid the steep slope because uh, the the divergence of the of the lidar, the footprints of of the spot, the the horizontal uh, projection of it on a steep slope will affect it is a vertical accuracy. So so try to avoid the steep slopes or, or rocky, for example. If you find gentle terrain slope, that will be the best place to place them. Have another question. Uh, how do how do you suggest overcoming the practical challenges of distributing this new message to surveyors and engineering engineers still insisting on using contours equivalent and scale standards? Did you understand the question, Carson? No, if you read it again, David, if you if you don't Sorry. Mind. Let me just <laughs> move the mic a little bit closer. How do you suggest overcoming the practical challenges of distributing this new message to surveyors and engineers still insisting on using contours equivalent 
and a scale standard. Yeah, I, I, I think I understood it now. If I may, uh, Dave, uh, comment on that, you can comment too. The, I, think, I think it's going to take, uh, as a learning process, as a new paradigm in thinking. Uh, we, we think it's going to be resistance, for example, for people to understand. Just to move from the idea from map scale to no map scale and from contour interval measure to no contour interval. So really going to take education and it's going to take a while. And that's why we were careful about that in the new standard by providing a lot of examples on conversion, you know, so how to relate. But the, the, the new standard and all the standard, the concept don't relate to each other because we stayed away, like we said, from counter interval, C factor calculation for the counter interval map, map scale. But we tried to make the transition a little bit easier for, for individual like that by looking at these table and they, how they relate to them. But there is no easy way. It's just going to take time and education for people to try for the, during the transition period to start thinking in the in new paradigm we are introducing in the in the new standard. Looking at accuracy at 10 centimeter instead of one foot contour support, for example. I concur with that. Okay, follow up question. Um, follow up question to the prior one. Um, is there a way to assess classification accuracy, meaning that the ground is correctly classified, vegetation is correctly classified, buildings are correctly classified? Not that I know. For me, from me, not that I know. But but like I said, the UAGS, at least the older one, they used to have like. 2% you evaluated. There's no easy way to find it. You know, this is a problem. When you say, uh, I allow only 2% of misclassified building, uh, how are you going to find it other than manual inspection? So that's why it is very gray area to quantify. You know, you can say 3% of the building misclassification. But how are you going to verify that? I think that's a question. There is not really an easy way, and I, no, nothing I'm aware of to prove that, you know, or to quantify. I think people often often do look at the uh, intensity images, or sometimes uh, uh, simultaneously acquired imagery, to see if the classification data appears to match the lighter classification data appears to match the imagery data. But that's not necessarily an easy thing to do either. It's very time consuming to do that. It's a manual work, that's what I said. Yeah. I mean there's no easy way to do it automatically. So it does gonna be David uh, the answer to again to gonna be you're gonna apply professional, you know, ethics when you deal with contract or what you have when you hire a contractor. You're just going to select the, the vendor or the company who you trust. They're going to do their best to do that because eventually you should be able to QC accuracy anywhere. And the vertical accuracy will show you. If there is, if there is building left more than the uh, specified one or permissible one, you're going to find it in the vertical accuracy check, for example. If you're going to find a, a line of a brush left in and you have vegetated accuracy check, VBA check, you're going to find it is not fitting. I mean, you can check it. You can pick it up that way. But uh, but again, it's really hard to verify. You need somebody you can trust is going to deliver to you that kind of product. Now it is relatively easy with high density uh, lighter point cloud data to see if buildings are remaining in the in the digital service model or the digital train model rather uh, because they do stand out very clearly and there will be other artifacts that you, that will need to be looked into to see is that a, is that really there or is that uh, something that should be removed to the bare earth ground 
so that's that's pretty routine part of the QAQC process. Yeah, but but the quantify. I think the question about the quantified specification. I mean, you will find the building, but are those ten percent, five percent, two percent of the total building? Oh. I agree with you. There's no way to get the when people say our data is not is classified 95 percent correctly. That's very hard to prove one way or another. Yeah. And, and we have last one. Um, how about location of base monitoring station? For example, what effect does placement of ground monitoring station have on the accuracy of the air triangulation results? The you mean the base station of the GPS? I assume, right? Yes, I'm assuming that's what the person is referring to. Yeah, the, okay, I can comment on that. This is really, you know, there is different school of thoughts about how far you can go before a drift and shift problems start kicking in the aerial triangulation. So, so really depends on on many on many factors. For example, if you're flying. 5 centimeter imagery versus 15 centimeter, which is the resolution, which affect the, the required accuracy. If you are, if your software using an aerial triangulation can handle shift and a drift in the GPS, for example, that's that's another factor, because the European school of thought they fly far away. I mean, they could be. 200, 300 kilometers away from the base station, but they always, on routine basis, they apply and they design their block to support shift and drift in the GPS. So they run it in the aerial triangulation. So there are so many factors, you know, but, but, uh, but again, really it depends on your software of handling the GPS problem and picking it up. If you have that kind of modeling, then you can go, you can go far, 60, 70 miles or 100 kilometers. If if you don't have that capability, you really need to be conservative. You know, I would say probably uh, 50 miles maximum, which is uh, what is that? Uh, time 1.6 it will be in kilometers, 60, 70 kilometers. Uh, you need to be within that. You stay within that. And that's basically our last question. Thank you. OK. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's GeoByte. Um, our next GeoByte is set up for October 16, and it's going to be on Google Earth Engine programming side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Cosm. You're welcome. You're welcome. I know. Bye.